Have you ever felt like you were carrying a burden too difficult to bear? If you were to perhaps describe this situation, it's almost as if it's impossible for tears not to begin to flow. The weight, the pressure, the despair, the hopelessness. Many times in our life, we carry with us scars, not just physical scars, but emotional, spiritual, and physical. And if we're honest, we can feel overwhelmed. We can feel that there is no hope, that our situation is hopeless, and we long for a time of deliverance. We long for freedom from this difficulty, but again and again and again, and nobody seems to understand actually what we're going through. Many of us have gone through seasons like this. Perhaps you yourself are going through one right now. Perhaps the the struggle that you're dealing with on the inside that you fully cannot describe to anyone is a crushing weight and you feel overwhelmed, you feel unheard and unseen. The stories that we're going to look at today in Scripture, I believe, are a beautiful parallel of two daughters in totally different circumstances that are in desperate need of God's healing grace. And although Jesus in these stories heals them physically, he goes far beyond that. For the text says that he doesn't just take care of their physical problems. He heals them fully they become whole. He meets them in their physical need, their emotional need, and brings them to a place of life, dignity, and a renewed sense of belonging. It's important for us to understand the context of what's going on here, specifically in the lady who has this issue of blood. If you look at uh, Leviticus chapter 15, it shows in great detail what would happen uh, during this time. Uh, This woman had a physical ailment that caused her to bleed, and that bleeding did not stop for 12 years. It's difficult for us to wrap our minds around what 12 years would feel like, but uh, as, as, as providence would have it, Uh, This story uh, pictures two people who are either 12 years old or had a difficulty for 12 years, and I just happen to have a daughter who is 12 years old. My daughter was born um, August uh, 26, 2011. It's a long time ago. Uh, She's 12, going on 13. I always say my kids are two years apart, and when they're evens or odds, I know their ages. Once one of them changes, I don't know. They're all in that area. Right now, they're 12, 10, 8, and 6, but once the next one has a birthday, every I just forget it, okay? They're all under 12. 12 years is a long time. Um, I think of our lives 12 years ago, uh, having our first daughter, first child, Um, I feel like we ourselves were children at that time, uh, (laughs) having kids, having kids. And you're thinking to yourself, I was so young, I was so ignorant, I was so so immature. But that 12 years is a very long time. Well, this woman, because of this physical ailment that she was experiencing, this bleeding that was not stopping, she herself would have been ceremonially unclean. You see, it's a lot different than it is today, but lives were so intertwined socially and through the religious uh, ceremony, specifically the Old Testament law, she would have been unclean. But it wasn't just that she was unclean. Every one that she touched and every thing that she touched would have been considered unclean. Uh, we've talked a little bit in this series about the, um, the, the disease of leprosy and how that would have caused not just physical pain, but social outcast. We don't know how old this woman is. I read a lot of commentaries that kind of brought some light to her situation, saying that perhaps she would have been experienced this early on in her marriage or perhaps younger in her age. And it probably would not be beyond reason to, if she was married, that her husband may would have put her away or divorced her. 
Um, she probably lived in a, in a sense of isolation. She would have been loved by people, but they would not have been able to come to her and embrace her. Many of you go through difficulties and trials, and sometimes just a warm embrace, a hug, would mean the world. Uh, she could not experience that. She would have had to live isolated in a, in a scenario where she would not have been able to touch other things other people would have touched. Her life was in 100% despair. It goes beyond her physical. It becomes more um, economical. She, every, every opportunity, every doctor that promised, I can help you, I can fix you, she poured all of her resources trying to find a remedy, a cure for this ailment that would not go away. I cannot imagine a scenario like that. Uh, we live in a, in a society today where, you know, when somebody is sick and somebody's going through a difficulty, we want to come alongside them. I, I believe that's one of the most uh, painful realities of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that we went through is talking to nurses and doctors, expressing their, the, the anguish it was to see loved ones dying alone without their loved ones next to them. Um, that feeling of isolation, that feeling of being ostracized, that feeling of being unable to be understood, she was dealing with this. Now we have on the other side, a young girl, Jairus, comes to Jesus and and this young maiden we don't know exactly what has caused this problem but her her sickness had become so severe that she was close to death you know it's hard for me to understand and I, I don't know of anyone that can probably fully understand what that would feel like but if any one of my children were going through a physical ailment that was leading them to death as a father, as a mother, you would do anything for them. And we see that. Jairus was a, a religious leader, and here he is. All of, that, all of that position, all of that authority just kind of goes by the wayside, and he falls at the feet of Jesus saying, I need help. I can't do this. My daughter is dying. Yesterday, we were in the truck uh, driving to go fishing, and I don't know how this, got, this conversation came up, but I think one of the greatest parts about spending time with your kids alone is the conversations that you have. Now, I am not saying that we wax eloquently. We're not like we're reciting Shakespeare. We were talking about random things, and one, somehow my son Titus brought up the fact that the Mona Lisa is worth a lot of money. Okay, And it is. It is. It is. I didn't know how much. Anybody have a, just a guesstimation how much the Mona Lisa is worth? Yes. Remember? Do you remember? Whoa, that's right on. According to Google, um, I did Google while I was driving, just to throw that out there. Uh, we missed our turn, but we got around, okay? Um, $860 million, Titus said. Wow, you'd have to have a really good job. I said, you have to have a remarkable job or you have to be in politics if you had that much money. Um, and uh, so he said, I said, $860 million, that's a lot of money. He says, so what would you do like if you had $860 million? I said, well, I said, it's, kind of, it's, it's kind of a unique situation because the Mona Lisa is one of those paintings. It's not like if you just had $860 million, you could just go down and say, I would like to buy the Mona Lisa it's kind of an invaluable object. It's not like it's for sale, okay? I'm sure somebody would sell it first. I don't know who even owns it specifically. But the Mona Lisa, is, it's an invaluable. And then I used that opportunity. I said, I said, I said Titus, I said, for instance, I said, everything, not, you can't buy everything with money. I said, what's the most important thing in the world is our relationship with Christ. And I said, after that, it's my family. I said, there's no money value that I would give for my children. Now, he did not realize this. I had just read a story that happened in the 1940s about a It's tragic. Don't even look it up. It's just the worst that you can imagine. She sold her kids. She was going through a difficult time. She sold her kids. It's just, you just, you're just, you're, the inner bones of your soul just ache with that story. But I told him there's no amount of money. I said, think about this. If you gave me a billion dollars, I said, Without my family, without my wife, without my kids, without my loving, what good is life, you know? It's invaluable. So when we see a story like this, when we see Jairus, basically nothing in his life, his, his position, his prominence, his wealth, all of that goes out the window because his daughter is about to die. 
And he comes to the feet of Jesus and he cries out saying, come to my house and heal my daughter. There's two daughters in this story. There's a woman who's had an issue of blood for 12 years. And we have a daughter who's on the verge of death, ultimately dies physically. And the only one who could heal, the only one that could enter into that pain is the Lord Jesus. I want us to see three observations from this text of scripture that I believe will help us. Because if we're honest, we've all gone through times where we feel overwhelmed. We feel the weight of the sorrow, the brokenness of this world. And we need hope. We need Jesus. The first observation I want us to see is in your deepest sorrow, you are not invisible to Jesus. You could come to me and say, Pastor Joel, nobody understands what I am going through. Were it not for Jesus and the promise that we have a high priest who's been touched with all the feelings of our infirmities and we can come to him, I would say you're right. Apart from the Lord Jesus, he's the only one that knows exactly what you're going through. You could right now go be going through something and you say, I've tried to tell people. I've tried to explain it to people. I've tried to bear, share the burdens. I, I want to, uh, to bear one another's burdens. I want, to, I, want to, I want people to pray for me, but nobody really understands. Nobody really knows. And I feel invisible. I don't feel seen. Can I say this? In the midst of the crowd, when the throngs of people were coming to him, as Jesus came back to Galilee, this gathered crowd comes around him. And in the midst of the crowd, Jesus specifically sees the needs of every single person there. He sees your need. You are not invisible to God. I don't care how bad, how dark your life seems right now. Jesus knows exactly what you're going through, and you can come to him. We talked about last week, cast your burdens upon here, cast your cares upon him. He cares for you. You may right now be going through something, you say nobody understands. You might be right apart from the Lord Jesus. Nobody can see really, that is true, but Jesus sees it. In our struggles, in our silent cries, we are not invisible to him. He sees your pain. He knows what you're going through. He can sympathize and empathize with the struggle. He felt the pain of this woman who had been isolated, this woman who had been um, uh, shunned from society. You see, Jesus himself endured the cross, despising the shame. Jesus himself was the only one who was fully rejected by the, the Father as the wrath of God was poured out. He drank the cup of God's wrath for us. Jesus understands that. Jesus was the only one who did not deserve to have anything go wrong in his life. He was the only perfect man. And yet Jesus experienced that and he experienced it for us. Why? That he would know what we are going through, that God would be glorified. So do not ever believe the lie that God does not care. God cares about you. You know, you, sometimes we read this story and the first thing that comes to my mind <laughs> is the girl is dying. This woman has been dealing with this pain for 12 years. My insensitivity and my lack of compassion says, run to Jairus' house. Ignore her. We'll take care of her later. Sometimes we think that our struggle is not important enough that God, there's no such thing as an interruption with God. God sees what we're going through, your pain, your prayer is not an interruption. God invites us individually all to come to him, big or small. While this was happening, this situation, this interruption that took place, Jesus sees the need of this woman who needs to be healed, not just physically, but she needs to be healed uh, emotionally, she needs to be brought back to a place of, 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 of love. And uh, he heals her in that moment. At that same time, this girl dies. This girl dies. Um, this woman comes to Jesus, and she 
in her mind, she does something incredibly brave. It's an amazing step of faith. She, she says, if I will just touch the, 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 the outer skirt of his garment, I will be healed. Uh, she did not feel, it's interesting, she did not feel that her, uh, it was worthy of her to interrupt the, the, this, this, this uh, procession to the home. She just reached out and immediately the Bible says that the bleeding stopped. Immediately as she touched, by faith, she was healed. Jesus, we know the story, he turns around. You gotta love, the scripture always mentions, mentions Peter. Peter and, and they that were with him said, Master, uh, the multitude thronged thee and, you, and you're asking who touched me. Uh, the, the gospel writers are great at just kind of nailing, nailing Peter sometimes, you know. Peter's like, hey, Jesus, come on, we're, we're, you know, everybody's, everybody's here, there's a hundred, there's a thousand people here, you know, like, it, it could be anybody, what, you know, and of course, uh, Peter gets named, and there's others as well. They're saying, you know, how, how could you know? Well, Jesus says, well, I, 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 I felt, I perceived virtue going out of me, and at that moment, this woman just pours out and, and explains everything that she uh, had been going through, and it, it leads us really into this next observation of this text, that in your deepest despair, you are not forsaken. God promises that he will never leave you nor forsake you. I, I, um, sometimes we think uh, about the grace of God, and we see how God's grace in our own lives, and he saves us, but when we fail, I mean, when we do something, when, we, when, we, when we're at, a, at, a, at, a, at the worst part in our life, you know, we, we sometimes think like, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe we've gone too far. Maybe, maybe I've done too much. But God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is abounding to, to sinners. God's grace is abounding to those that are in hopeless situations. God, we are not, no matter how despair, uh, how much hopelessness is in our life, Scripture wants us to see that we are not forsaken by, by Jesus. When she came, she was um, trembling, and she fell down before him. And the Scripture says that she declares unto Jesus and all the people uh, for why she touched him and how she was healed immediately. That took an amazing amount of courage. Why? Okay. Think of what she just said. They know the ceremonial uncleanness. They probably knew her story, many people around. But when she declares, I took this step of faith, for if Jesus was not truly the Messiah, if, Drew, if Jesus was not truly God, she would have been taking her hand, which would have been ceremonially uncleaned, and touched the garment of this, this uh, rabbi, this teacher, causing him, him, he himself to be unclean. And she proclaimed that to everybody. And I'll be honest with you, that would have been a shameful moment. Jesus doesn't send her away. Jesus doesn't condemn her. No, Jesus says, your faith has made you whole. You are complete. Jesus doesn't just reach into the physical pains. He restored her fully. The book of Joel in the Old Testament gives us illustration that God will redeem the time that the locusts have devoured. I really believe that in that moment, Jesus was giving us a picture of things to come, that one day God will wipe away all the tears from our eyes, that God will restore, unto, uh, restore all things back to good. In the new heavens and the new earth, I believe when he, when he healed this woman, she was not just healed physically. She was, those, those 12 years of agony were removed. That pain was gone. Her life had been restored. No matter where you find yourself in your life, remind yourself that God is never going to leave you nor forsake you. You might be in, your, in the worst scenario. You might be in absolute despair. God is not going to forsake you. Lastly, I want us to see through this story that in your scars, in your brokenness, you are never broken beyond repair. You are not broken beyond repair. The truth is, each of us carries scars. Each of us has wounds. Each of us have scars that we, we, we feel, the heartache, this, this, this difficulty in our life. This woman 
was actually dead physically. That's what the scripture says. It's interesting to me when you look at this passage of scripture, um, there was a point where Jairus said, I need your help, Jesus. And I don't believe Jairus saw or heard what happened with the woman and thought to himself, you know, how dare you? I don't think he had that, that thought. But during that time, perhaps he was already back with his daughter. Between that time and with the time Jesus gets to the house, a servant says, go tell the master, go tell the teacher, he's no longer needed. Things are too bad. Things have gone too far. It is now beyond hope. It's broken. It cannot be fixed. While perhaps Jesus could have been there when she was dying and give her healing, because I've seen this happen Now things are too far. This life has been shattered too much. The mistakes have been made. Um, The decisions, there's, I've done too much in my life that I don't, there's no more hope. I've broken this world that I live in. I've caused too much pain. I've done, and this brokenness, this is not going to happen. So they literally come to Jesus and listen to what they say. He says um, in verse number 49, while he yet spake, there cometh one from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, thy daughter is dead, trouble not the master. But when Jesus heard it, he answered and said, saying, fear not, believe only, and she shall be made whole. So what happens? This, this, the, 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 the story says that there, it's, it's come to a point where there, you know, Jesus is no longer needed, they think. And even in that scenario, when you might say that their faith had faltered. Uh, Jesus pursues, and he says, don't fear, she will be made whole. Reminds me of Psalm 147, where it says, he healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. God is a healing God. God is a God who steps into our brokenness and fixes our lives. He gives us hope. He gives us restoration And Jesus comes to this maid. He only brings his inner um, circle of disciples, Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother. It's interesting. The crowd, you know, laughs him to scorn. They're basically mocking him, saying, how dare you? How could you do this with the pain that they're going through? How could you say these things? Jesus says, no, she will live again. She's just sleeping. She will live again. He comes. He, 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 uh, he took her by the hand. He called and said, maid, arise. Her spirit came again, and she rose straightway, and he commanded her uh, to give them, uh, she commanded to give her meat. So what happens in this story? Jesus goes into a position, goes into a place that you would think, that I would think, things are, it's worse than it could ever be. It's broken beyond repair. There's no more hope. This is, it, I've done too much. And Jesus says, no, even in that brokenness, I can heal. Even in that brokenness, I can restore. Even in that brokenness, we can make things new. That's what the new heavens and the new earth is going to be. One day, Jesus is going to make all things new. All the brokenness, all of the pain, all the sorrow will be wiped away. And God will reverse the curse that happened in the Garden of Eden. I don't know where you are at in your life right now. I don't know the difficulties that you're going through. I don't know the difficulties that you have been going through. Um, You say, well, you probably will never be able to fully understand. I may not be able to, but God does. And God sees that. You're never broken beyond repair. You're never too far from God's grace. My encouragement is come to Jesus by faith. That was the avenue. Both Jairus and both of this woman, they both came to Jesus by faith, believing that Jesus could do for them what they could not do for themselves. Come to Jesus, and he is the one that can heal you. He is the one that can make you whole. I love what C.S. Lewis said, hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. You might be going through a scenario right now in your life. You might be experiencing pain in your life right now that God is going to restore, that God is going to heal you from. But you may live with the scars for the rest of your life, and you might have the, the reminder of this pain, but those scars can be a testimony of God's grace. 
Scars are a, are, are, are a promise of healing. Scars are a, a picture that, that w- there, this wound has then not now been healed, and it might have a story of God's grace and restoration, and you might be able to use your scars and the pain that you've gone through to help somebody else in their Christian walk. What does it all come down to? It all comes down to faith believing that no matter how bad things get in our lives, no matter if we feel broken, alone, isolated, invisible, unseen, Jesus is the only one that can restore us. Jesus is the only one that can give us hope. Jesus is the only one that can make all things new. Then what does that mean? Come to Jesus by faith. Fall at his feet and say, Jesus, I need your help. Stop believing the lie that you're broken beyond uh, repair. Stop believing the lie that nobody cares. Stop believing all the lies that the world and Satan wants you to believe and understand that Jesus will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He sees you in your difficulty. He sees you in your sorrow. And no matter where you are at, God's grace is sufficient for you. Let's pray.